Welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, delighted to, to be here. Incredibly excited to be the new CEO of Aviva. And uh, welcome to our results uh, for 2018. Um, I'm going to start by uh, handing over um, to my chairman. Uh, he was our executive chairman just up to a few days ago. So I'm going to hand over to Adrian in a second to, to make a few comments. Um, then you're going to hear from Tom, who will uh, walk through the numbers. Um, I'm going to be a little bit quieter than normal today. I don't, don't get used to that, by the way. But then after Tom, you're going to come up and, and hear, and I'm going to give you some of my initial thoughts um, on Aviva um, and start to share some of my leadership philosophies. And then we'll open up, as we normally do, to Q&A. So I'll start, uh, Adrian, by uh, handing the stage to yourself. <coughs> Well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our 2018 results presentation. You may notice a change of tone this morning from recent years. We're going to be more matter-of-fact, we're going to be more down-to-earth, and I think there'll be fewer fireworks. After all, what could you expect from a couple of ex-lawyers like Tom and me? So I'm just going to say a couple of words before handing over the stage to Tom who will lead us through the results presentation. And then Maurice will come back for his first thoughts and impressions. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate Maurice on his appointment uh, most warmly. He will be an outstanding CEO. He's an operator. He knows the business inside out. He's built strong teams against, uh, across both our life and our general insurance businesses. And he knows our strengths, and he knows, more importantly, where we need to improve. So I'm confident that he's extremely well qualified to re-energize Aviva and to deliver long-term growth. Now, I said in October that we would conduct a global search because we wanted to be sure that we had the best possible CEO for Aviva. We looked closely at a number of external candidates. But ultimately it, ultimately, it came down to a straight but very, very tough choice between our two excellent internal candidates. And in the event, the board unanimously selected Morris. Uh, we have been extraordinarily lucky to have two candidates of the caliber of Morris and Andy. And I'd like to pay particular tribute here to Andy, who is the consummate professional and really worthy of the highest recognition. So next, I want to explore briefly how we have prepared for the arrival of our new CEO. Uh, again, I said in October that we would not let the grass grow under our feet, and we have not. There's a lot to do to enhance the operational efficiency of the group. We have taken some good first steps, but we've also paved the way for our new CEO in identifying a number of further opportunities for the future. Morris will say a word about this later on, but first I'll hand over to you, Tom, for the results. Well, thanks, Adrian, and thanks, Morris, and good morning, everyone. Today's presentation will focus primarily on Aviva's 2018 results, followed by a brief summary of our outlook for 2019 and our current priorities. Now, this is my fifth year reporting on Aviva's performance, and I'll try to keep my part of the show as straightforward and as dull as ever. I hope you won't mind that. <laughs> as you know, we've had plenty of unexpected news over the last year, including a CEO change, and so it's good to get past the past and focus on the business we're running for the future. Let me add that it's great to have a homegrown talent like Morris taking the reins so that we can move quickly to keep building on today's results. Now, the headlines on the slide behind me are solid. Operating EPS up 7% to 58.4 pence per share, beating our target. Solvency 2 cover ratio at 204%, well above our desired working range. Cash remittances up 31% to a record 3.1 billion pounds, and the cash dividend per share up 9% to 30p. Aviva's delivered steady results again, and our people should be very proud of their performance. But having said that, we recognize there is still much more work to do to optimize our performance and reignite the self-help agenda in terms of cost efficiency, business complexity, and reducing debt leverage. This is the task for Morris and will help make Aviva simpler, stronger, and better at serving our customers. 
Now, over the last five years, we've significantly improved the company's financial flexibility and capacity for growth. Back in 2015 and 2016, operating EPS grew modestly as we absorbed and consolidated a large acquisition that bolstered the balance sheet and improved cash flow. Since then, we've been able to both invest for growth and return excess capital to investors. Operating EPS has increased by 7% for each of the last two years, and throughout this time, we've also delivered strong growth in dividends per share, which have doubled from 15 pence for 2013 to 30 pence in 2018. Meanwhile, we've increased our spending on digital innovation and modernizing our IT infrastructure while reducing integration restructuring costs to zero for the first time in recent memory. We're very pleased with the way our track record has developed. At the same time, while we've clearly established the foundations for future growth, we have been disappointed that a number of the investments we've made have not paid off as quickly or as handsomely as we might have hoped. And so we are redoubling our focus on execution and reconsidering how we might adapt our operating model to drive higher returns. On the one hand, this means more focus on customer outcomes and managing closer to the business. On the other, it means renewed focus on eliminating duplication, complexity, and excess costs from the business. Now more than ever, our future success depends on how well we execute. So as we try to extend our track record of growth, we can see that our new CEO will need flexibility to make strategic choices about how and when to invest in growth opportunities and how to reshape the business. So to provide that flexibility, the board has decided to move to a progressive dividend policy, which means that the dividend remains safe and secure and should grow as the business grows over time. Meanwhile, Morris will have the latitude to consider different choices from those we might have made in order to hit the prior payout ratio target of 55 to 60% by 2020. So while we achieved a payout ratio of 51.4% this year, in the future the board will simply consider dividend increases more aligned with its long-term view of the business and likely to be lower in terms of percentage growth than the rapid increases you can see on the slide that we've experienced over the last five years. The future payout ratio may be higher or lower than this year, but our plan is to maintain or grow the dividend per share every year. Okay, so let's get into the 2018 results in a little bit more detail. As you can see here, we continue to see good breadth of performance from our major markets, with six of the eight delivering better than 5% growth. Aviv investors taking a step back, and Canada flat but regaining momentum. Collectively, our major markets increased operating profit by 7% to 3.7 billion, as you'll see in the fuller picture on the next slide. Now, this was no small feat in a year of increased competition in difficult markets. On the life side, value of new business, VNB, actually declined 3% to 1.2 billion, but after adjusting for disposals, was up 2%. On the general insurance side, net premiums written were stable at 9.1 billion, with more growth in commercial lines, offset by softer motor markets, and the combined operating ratio steady at 96.6%. We're pleased with this, with this performance in this environment. I'm going to take you one by one through the major markets, but I'll come back to this slide again. As I review each market, it's important to keep in mind the headlines because we manage the group as a whole with an eye on how each market is doing. Again, the headlines are that operating EPS was up 7% to 58.4 pence, and since for the first time we ran no integration and restructuring costs below the line, operating EPS after such costs was up 12%. Back in the appendices, you'll also see that operating return on equity increased to 14%. So without further ado, let's get into the markets starting here in the United Kingdom. UK insurance was up 7% to 2.3 billion, which was a good result in the face of increased competition and other challenges. The UK also remitted 2.5 billion in cash to the center, and I want to make a special point of thanking Andy and his team for that performance. Our five main operating segments in the UK saw operating profit increase 4% to almost 2 billion, and our success in managing back books of life insurance and annuity business, including the favorable impact of longevity trends, has added other profits of 350 million. As I've mentioned previously, we've reinvested some of this extra profitability in digital innovation, modernizing our IT estate, and other regulatory and other change programs that should position us better in the future. Within the UK, operating profit in annuities and equity release rose 7% 7 to 779 million, with sales up 12% on the back of higher bulk purchase annuity volumes, including our largest ever transaction of 925 million, which we reported to you at the half year. 
Also, our asset origination caught up with liability matching as expected during the second half. Long-term savings operating profit also rose 7% to $198 million. Net fund flows were $5 billion versus $5.6 billion in the prior period. We had higher fund flows in workplace pensions, where our innovative propositions helped us to win new schemes with large corporates such as British Airways. This was offset by lower flows into the advisor platform, which was affected by disruptions caused by our migration to a new IT provider and are now largely resolved. Weak investment markets at year end meant that assets under administration ended at 116 billion, down a bit from 118 billion at the prior year end. In protection, operating profit was flat at 226 million with better results in group protection where we addressed adverse claims experience from 2017 but offset by weaker results in individual protection where new business volumes fell 8% due to increased competition and where margins were lower in part due to increased reinsurance costs. The legacy life portfolio is running down as expected with operating profit declining 4% in the year to 318 million. On the general insurance side in the UK, operating profit was 415 million and the combined operating ratio was stable at 93.8%. More favorable prior year development offset higher weather and large loss experience. Net, net premiums written rose 3% to 4.2 billion, propelled by increases in commercial lines. Overall, our UK GI business has been a consistent contributor to results for over a decade now and won the Insurance Times General Insurer of the Year Award for the fifth consecutive year. Okay, turning now to Aviva Investors. As you know, the fund management industry has had a challenging year, and Aviva Investors has been no exception. Top line revenue growth slowed to 4%, but was still positive, and the Ames range of funds saw assets reduced to 10 billion from 13 billion. <coughs> Nevertheless, we've continued to invest for the future, not quite at the pace we would have liked, but in any event, with expenses increasing faster than revenues. We've continued to build out our capabilities in equities and in real assets, while also absorbing MIFID II costs without passing them on to customers. The result has been that operating profit at Aviva Investors was down 10% to $150 million. This is, isn't really that bad, though, and a very tough year for the industry. The UN is more encouraged at our start to 2019, although future results will depend critically on investment markets and performance fees. In Canada, the overall result is flat to last year. But this belies how much progress Calm and the team have really made. Elevated weather and large loss experience have weighed on the result, as have persistent challenges in the motor market and costs of completing the integration of the RBC insurance book. Prior year development was favorable. The combined operating ratio came in at 102.4%, about the same as last year's 102.2, and net written premiums were also stable at 2.9 billion. Now looking forward, in Ontario, we've received approval for an 8.6% rise on the Aviva Motor Book and a 16.8% rise on the RBC Book. This will be implemented in the first quarter and will partially benefit results in 2019 and more so in 2020. Accordingly, we remain confident that we can achieve our sub-96% combined operating ratio goal for 2020. In France, operating profit of 546 million was up 8% in sterling and 7% local currency, with increased demand for savings products leading to a 6% increase in new business volumes to 4.3 billion pounds. Life insurance operating profit grew 7% in France to 436 million on the back of higher average asset balances and tight control of expenses, which increased only 1%. General insurance profit rose 5% to 110 million, with net written premiums growing 5% to 1.1 billion, with most of the growth in commercial lines, and the overall combined operating ratio remained stable at 94.5%. Patrick and his team are realigning our distribution channels in France under the Aviva brand, and look forward to continuing their momentum as we invest further in the brand, distribution, and digitization in 2019. In Poland, Operating profit of 190 million was up 7% in sterling and 6% local currency, despite subdued trends in the life insurance market. Adam and his team responded with a targeted product strategy through our distribution partners, delivering record levels of customer retention and managing expenses tightly. Our life businesses increased new business volumes by 3% and operating profit by 8% to 170 million pounds. In general insurance, operating profit was about flat at 20 million with lower profitability in motor insurance where we need to build more scale. 
Okay, in Italy, operating profit of 188 million was up 16% in both sterling and local currency, with life insurance sales rising 37% in local currency to 6.3 billion pounds. Our hybrid products, which combined with profits, unit length, and protection features, grew 161% and contributed 44% of our total life sales, up from 23% from the prior year. We also expanded and diversified our distribution capability, with non-bank channels now contributing over 40% of life insurance sales. So altogether, our market share of premiums on the life side is now up to about 6% in Italy. And in general insurance, net premiums written fell 7% as we wrote less motor business, but margins improved, so GI operating profit increased 25% to 32 million. I should also point out that it's been a volatile year for the macro economy in Italy, with fiscal policies adversely affecting credit spreads. So these results show that Nacho and his team have done a great job for Aviva, managing both our rapid expansion and our capital position in this market. In Ireland, operating profit of 100 million was up 16% in sterling and 15% in local currency, including the acquisition of Friends First, which completed on the 1st of June, 2018. As reflected on this morning's opening slide, we extended our sponsorship of the Aviva Stadium in Dublin, which is a key element of our brand strategy and very important for John Quinlan and the rest of the team in Ireland. The acquisition of Friends First accounted for most of this year's increase in operating profit, although the GI business increased slightly as well to 56 million, with the combined operating ratio staying strong at 91.5%. In addition, we've prepared for Brexit by incorporating a new legal entity and taking other steps to transfer our Irish branch business back into Ireland from the UK. And finally, in Singapore, operating profit of 125 million was up 14% in sterling and 16% in local currency. We continue to grow our Aviva Financial Advisors Network to 816 advisors, and our total advisors network in Singapore is now up to 1,540 advisors. As a result, new business volumes increased 11% to 1.3 billion, and life operating profit increased 21% to 141 million. However, our GI business continued to run at a loss in Singapore, primarily due to adverse claims experience in our health portfolios, which we are remediating. Stepping back, as I look at this business overall, I continue to find remarkable the complete revamp Nish has accomplished in our Singapore operations, taking us from over-reliance on bank distribution to an entirely new business model based on high margin sales through affiliated financial advisors. Really, really well done. So overall, our major markets were up 7% to 3.7 billion of operating profit. But it's important to consider the remainder of the P&L because we manage the company on an overall basis and make decisions in the context of being able to deliver for Aviva as a whole. As you can see from the slide, partly offsetting the major market growth is an increase in costs from our investments in strategic investments and corporate and other costs. Now the increase in strategic investment costs to 142 million is largely attributable to the development of our digital capabilities in the UK some of which we had expected to recoup from higher sales volumes and internal commissions. However, we fell short of our internal ambitions on sales as market conditions softened, which left less to cover some of these development expenses. Digital remains central to our strategy, but we are revisiting how we can drive stronger commercial outcomes from our investments in this area. Corporate costs rose to 224 million as we stepped up the pace of investing to modernize our IT infrastructure as well as absorbing other spend on IFRS 17, GDPR, and other major change programs. Now we've calibrated the cost of such investments against the profitability afforded by our businesses, including the benefits of longevity releases, so that we can make Aviva better for the future while still delivering steady results in the year. I expect this will continue in 2019 and 2020, but these programs all have planned end dates. Put differently, we could have invested less in modernization and delivered a higher EPS result as a consequence. But because we were satisfied with 7% operating EPS growth, we've been able to take a longer term view of what it takes to position the company to compete in the future. This means spending to move applications to the cloud, investing in data, and streamlining operations. So please keep this balance in mind as we explain EPS movements in the next slide and later when I talk about our outlook for 2019. Now this next slide takes a different look at our profitability, 
summarizing some of the moving parts, explaining the 7% increase in operating earnings per share. Disposals had less of an impact than we expected because of the ongoing delay in completing the sale of Friends Provident International. And capital management had a larger impact and will give us a bit of a tailwind going into 2019. More importantly, in the middle of the page, you can see that underlying growth was about 3%, and the net contribution of other impacts was a positive 1.5%. So while we're satisfied with 7% operating EPS growth, we need to drive stronger underlying growth. Within the green bar on assumption changes, we have the benefit of re releasing longevity reserves of 780 million, which is in line with the prior year. This is partly offset by additional provisions, including a 175 million pound increase in customer remediation reserves related to very old advised sales by Friends Provident. And as guided previously, the other segment in our UK insurance business would normally be expected to contribute between 150 and 200 million to our results, but this year it has been higher than normal at 350 million relative to 260 million the prior year. Note that it may be above this, the expected range again in 2019 unless longevity trends reverse. Now they should stop at some point, but in the meantime, they're providing an extra boost to our profitability. And as I mentioned before, and is included in the red bar in the middle, we are reinvesting some of this excess profitability in a higher temporary level of change spent. We also continue to believe that our longevity reserving remains towards the prudent end of industry benchmarks even after the releases in 2018. Okay, turning now to the balance sheet and beginning with net asset value or NAV, you can see that book value per share was flat as we return capital to investors and we're impacted by negative market movements and pension remeasurements. Brexit remains very topical today, so you should note that within the market movements, we've added an additional 100 million pounds to our Brexit reserve as at year end, bringing the total to approximately 400 million in addition to other customary reserves. Basic earnings per share of 38.2 pence was stable relative to the prior year, with additional benefit from a positive exceptional item related to the Ogden rate where we've revised our assumption from a negative 0.75% to simply 0%. And as I mentioned previously, we've absorbed all integration restructuring costs this year and operating expenses, so there is no extra drag below the line from that. Our capital story is a, uh, a pretty good one. Despite returning 1.5 billion of capital and paying out 1.2 billion in dividends, and despite difficult investment markets, our solvency capital ratio increased another six points to 204%, keeping us well above our target working range. We've simplified that working range slightly, making it 160 to 180, with a midpoint of 170%. Now, we've increased the bottom end of the range from 150, primarily because we found that the levels of capital we're targeting at our subsidiaries, combined with the group diversification benefit of EVA enjoys, actually makes it very difficult for us to end up at 150 as a practical matter. So under normal circumstances, we should operate in the 160 to 180 range. We continue to carry excess capital at the moment, which is not a bad place to be with Brexit and other external uncertainties. But we would also expect to return a large amount of that excess capital through our debt deleveraging plans over the next few years. As a reminder, our capital also remains relatively insensitive to various stresses. We don't like interest rate risk and try to keep a tightly matched book and use hedging strategies to limit residual interest rate risk. In advance of Brexit, we've taken some additional steps, including more tactical hedging and the Brexit reserve I mentioned earlier. This should give us more room to deal with future adverse effects on UK property prices should they arise. We do lots of scenario planning, including extreme stresses and reverse stress tests, so we feel about as well prepared for adversity as we think we can be. The steady uptick in our capital ratio over the last few years is a good indicator of how we think about risk management. Likewise, we've consciously managed our investment portfolio for quality. Although we have a very big balance sheet, over three quarters is unit linked or, or participating business, where Aviva bears only a minority of the investment risk. That means that the remaining quarter of our shareholder portfolio um, including our annuity uh, book and general insurance books. And of this 80 billion, as you can see from these charts, we maintain well-rated and diversified portfolios of corporate bonds and government debt, and a mortgage portfolio with low loan to values and high coverage ratios. 
In terms of capital generation, 2018 was another strong year for operating capital generation, which amounted to $3.2 billion. This breaks down into $1.5 billion of underlying OCG and $1.7 billion of other capital actions. The underlying number is down $200 million from the prior year, partly because of higher digital and change spend and partly because of a smaller perimeter following disposals in Italy, Spain, and France. The other capital actions number, on the other hand, was very strong, fueled by longevity releases and risk management in the UK, as well as winning PRA approval of the dynamic volatility adjuster in France for use in our group model, as well as the France Pension Vehicle Benefit, or FRPS. Now, we returned $1.5 billion of capital to investors, paying down hybrid debt and buying back shares. Together with a modest amount of M&A, we redeployed $1.7 billion of cash toward our goal of deploying $3 billion over the course of 2018 and 2019. And we're not rushing to, re to spend the remaining $1.3 billion. Rather, with our new CEO and shifting priorities, we're extending the timeline beyond 2019 and we'll prioritize reinvestment in our existing operations and debt deleveraging. Based on our current outlook, there's less appetite for M&A in 2019. Capital has begun turning into cash in a big way, with a record $3.1 billion of remittances in 2018, up 31% over the prior year. As I've explained in the past, there typically is a lag between capital generation and conversion into cash remittances to the center, and you can see this playing out in our numbers. We've now generated $1.25 billion in special remittances from the Friends Life Capital Synergies, as well as another $750 million of special remittances in the UK from our Capital to Cash project. I'm anticipating additional special cash remittances in 2019 and 2020 from around the group. You'll also recall that we upped our cumulative cash target from $7 billion to $8 billion, but we fell just a hair short in the end, deciding to hold some extra cash in Italy and still not yet completing the sale of Friends Provident International. Nevertheless, our liquidity remains where we want it, with center cash of 1.6 billion, right in the middle of the one to two billion pound range we expect to hold. Our underlying cash flows cover the regular dividend to shareholders, while the special remittances give us additional capacity for debt to leveraging. And our plan is to repay without refinancing at least 1.5 billion of debt by 2021 or 2022, primarily from special dividends from subsidiaries. Relative to today, this equates to about a 20% debt reduction taking us about 10 points closer to our desired Solvency II capital working range and trimming four points off of our debt leverage ratios. We're comfortable now, we'll be even more comfortable at that point. Paying off this amount of debt will also save us about 90 million pounds a year in cash interest expense. Now, we only have about 200 million of debt maturing in 2019 and 500 million the following year, so we may set aside some extra cash at the center to effectively defease maturities out in 2021 or 2022 ahead of time. And you might ask, could we pay down more than 1.5 billion? Well, possibly, but it would depend on other strategic decisions on where we want to invest and how we want to optimize our business and our product mix. And we'll leave that to our new CEO, Morris. Which takes me to my wrap up. Last year for 2018, we provided relatively specific guidance around drivers of operating earnings per share and our overall target for operating EPS, which we ended up beating with 7% growth. This year's a little different. For 2019, given external uncertainties, including the potential impact of Brexit on the UK and Europe, our near-term outlook is more muted and Aviva is not yet confirming any earnings targets today. Having said that, our underlying businesses should continue to perform and I know that Morris intends to drive commercial outcomes very hard with increased focus on insurance fundamentals and operating efficiency. In addition, we've tried to set ourselves up for future success by addressing legacy issues, preparing for Brexit, strengthening the balance sheet, and taking a pro forma adjustment in our solvency to cover ratio for potential regulatory change on equity release mortgages. I'll, I'll also point you to a few specific potential headwinds and tailwinds on EPS. In 2019, we may have a higher operating tax rate depending upon business mix, especially if and when Canada begins to bounce back. We have some lingering impacts from disposals with uncertainty around when and if we'll be able to complete the sale of Friends Provident International. And on the positive side, we will benefit further in 2019 from some of the capital management 
share repurchases and debt repayment that we did in 2018. And we would expect Canada to continue its recovery towards a 2020 combined operating ratio below 96%. And speaking here today, it's also hard to say to exactly what degree beneficial longevity trends will offset the change spend we're undertaking this year. And with the new CMI tables due to be published again soon, we may yet again find in 2019 that we have more material benefits from longevity and future <coughs> results. As I mentioned earlier, our capital to cash program should drive high levels of cash remittances, including additional special dividends from subsidiaries around the group. And this will fuel our debt deleveraging plans. Finally, in terms of shareholder dividends, as I said at the outset, we're moving to a progressive dividend policy in part to emphasize the safety and security of the dividend while providing Morris a little more flexibility around future targets. So that's it for me on results. But before I hand it over to the guy you really want to hear from, let me say that we know you all have lots of questions about potential changes in strategic direction. And Morris will have plenty to say, just not today. <laughs> I'll ask you to be patient just a little bit longer so that Morris can imprint his vision on our plans and come back to you with better definition on where Aviva goes from here. And with that, let me welcome to the stage my good friend and colleague, Morris Tullock. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Adrian, uh, for your kind words this morning. And I appreciate the warm welcome that many of you in the room have offered me here today. You know, it gives me great pleasure to speak to you as the new CEO of Aviva PLC. I'm incredibly excited to take on this role. And perhaps somewhat out of character, you might want to understand that it's only day four, and hence, I'm going to keep my comments brief today. Don't get used to that, though. As many of you know, I've been with Aviva for most of my career. Um, and actually, I was recanting. I think I've worked in every one of our business units. I've just gotten hold of the steering wheel. So while I naturally have some pretty strong views about our strategic direction, I will spend time engaging with our investors and colleagues. <laughs> today, I want to leave you with really three points about my leadership philosophy, which ultimately will help shape the new Aviva. First, I'm going to bring a different pace and cadence to this organization. This is just how I've always operated. The board has hired me to drive long-term growth and re-energize this place. We are far too complex, and this is holding us back. This will change. Second. I will ensure a relentless focus on the fundamentals of being a great insurance company. We have all the ingredients, just not executing consistently. I plan to leave no stone unturned to drive better performance, and that has to start with delivering an exceptional customer experience. You know what? It's all about how you make people feel. This is a proven strategy. I pursued this some five years ago in running our UK general insurance business, and most recently in running our European business units. Third, my strategic and financial decisions will be rooted in commercial sense. This means, this means being more disciplined on project investment and in returns, and making sure we are prioritizing resources to the areas that will move the needle. There is much more work to be done on reducing leverage, as Tom mentioned, improving quality of earnings, and return on our shareholders' capital. You know, Viva has so many strengths. Committed and energetic staff, tremendous and diversified distribution, deep technical expertise, and most importantly, 33 million customers that rely on us each and every day. We need to be brilliant at pricing, underwriting, savings and retirement, investment performance, optimizing our product mix, and improving our cost efficiency each and every year. You know, for me, these areas will form the basis of an improved delivery for our customers, accelerate growth, and improve margins across Aviva. So let me recap. 
three themes. One, I'm going to bring a different pace and cadence to this place. I guarantee it. Two, I'm going to bring a relentless focus to the fundamentals of insurance for our customers and shareholders. And three, my strategic and financial decisions will always be rooted in commercial sense. This will undoubtedly form an integral part that you might want to call the Aviva self-help story. And I'm excited about unleashing the real potential, the untapped potential here in Aviva. As Tom said, you know, we have some headwinds and tailwinds, you know, which may temper growth in the short run. But make no mistake, I'm incredibly confident about growing this business over the long run. And I've got a track record of doing just that. I will come back to you in short order, in fact, in the second quarter, on what I'm doing, what the team are doing to drive operational improvement and make Aviva simpler. Then it is our intention to do a more detailed event in the latter part of the year here in London. In the meantime, I look forward to meeting many of you in the coming weeks, you know, re-establishing old relationships, building new ones, and getting a quick start on the task at hand. So thank you. Um, I'll now move into Q&A. Okay, everyone. Uh, can we start with uh, James Shook from City, please? Grab my water. Yeah. Thank you. Um, seems we've lost the balls we throw around, haven't we? Um, so I had three questions, um, if possible, please. Um, the balls cost us a lot of money, so. <laughs> <laughs> There's another joke there somewhere. <laughs> um, my, my first question, I mean, one of the criticisms about Viva is, is, is it's a strange collection of businesses um, with, with little kind of strategic coherence between them. Um, Morris, I'm just clean to get your idea of you know, how you actually drive value as a, a cohesive unit um, out of those uh, eight or so focused markets. Um, second question, on the digital and big project initiatives, I mean, it, I appreciate you're accelerating um, the, uh, the, the spend against the uh, longevity reserve releases, but there has been a big uptick in the digital and, and, and project spend. How do you view you know, how much of that is actually optional um, and how much you can actually turn that off? And when it actually comes to assessing projects, what will you look at in terms of returns, in terms of IRRs, payback periods, that sort of thing, when, you, when you're justifying that spend? Um, and then a final question. I may misinterpret this, but the, the dividend policy move away from a, a payout ratio towards a progressive one. Um, to me, by guaranteeing the absolute level of the dividend and, and that growing, that might suggest that you're less prone to do large-scale disposals, uh, because by doing so, the earnings actually might fall, and therefore, you, know, you have to guarantee the absolute level of that dividend. But perhaps I've just misread that, but trying to read things into the outlook for M&A. Thank you. Great, thanks, thanks, James. Let, let me take the, the first two questions and I'll, and I'll pass the, the third one on to, to Tom. Um, listen, I, I think when you look at our 14 markets and, and our two global businesses, one of the challenges, what is the transitional glue that, that, that holds them together? Um, I've been hired to make Aviva effectively run better. And, and my immediate focus is going to be on the fundamentals of the business. And it's also about getting world-class customer experiences. So those are the two, the two themes. You know, I want people to walk into, whether they're walking into Vietnam or whether they're walking into Poland or whether they're walking into one of our UK businesses that we're tremendous at insurance. You know, whether that is being great at pricing, you know, whether that is in how we service our customers, whether that's our investment management skills, or whether that's you know, cost efficiency that should improve you know, each and every year. And the second thing, for our customers, I want the experience. I don't want to be saying, hey, we're customer centric, the customer's at the heart of things. Those might be nice words, but they can come across as being a bit hollow. I want it to be something emotive, where our customers feel that whether they're buying the product, the service was simple and exceptional, whether they're having a claim, it's clear and clearly articulated in what they should expect, you know, or whether it's a, you know, a renewal, or whether when that product arrives, it's real simple and it does what it's gonna say on the tin. I think that's an important transitional glue that great insurance companies have, and that's what I plan to do 
so that they all feel very much like Aviva. I think on your, on your second question, um, listen, when I look at the, at, at the costs, um, I'm not pleased to see you know, a center cost up, up, up 24%. Now, clearly, there are some, some things in there, whether it be GDPR, you know, whether it be IRFS 17, you know, whether it be some of the IT that we had to do. But I would describe those costs as almost a high, letter, high water level mark. The digital costs were absolutely viable. We took that off site. We're going to bring that back into the business. And we had to build that innovation and technology. You know, and Chris and Blair and the team have done amazing things in terms of Maya Viva and the number of customers. I think we're now up to 5.3 million. But listen, that's only touching about 9% of our customers globally. So one of my themes is to bring what we've done and what we've learned and take it to the other 91%. I'm a channel agnostic leader. Our customers will decide how they want to come to Aviva. So look at it as a high water level mark and look for me to get value out of that spend as we move forward. Tom, do you want to talk about the... Yeah, just to pick up on the dividends and the question as to whether there's any read across there in terms of M&A or strategic activity, and, and you know, I, I, I'd say no, um, and I imagine we'll get other questions here, so let me just kind of attack it generally. That, you know, I, I think if we wanted to, we could go ahead and hit the old targets and, and hit the 55 to 60% payout ratio, um, but what we're trying to do is actually provide Morris an opportunity to think about strategy and, and reset financial targets in a way that makes sense with the way he's thinking about the business. So um, you shouldn't read anything else into that, then we're just trying to create a little bit more flexibility and delink it from the formula formulaic way that we've been talking in the past. So there really shouldn't be any read across in terms of whether we would or wouldn't sell a business. Uh, John Hawking from Morgan Stanley, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, John from Morgan Stanley. I've got three questions, please. Uh, two, two for Morris and one for Tom. Uh, Morris, looking at the shape of the group, you've talked a little bit about project spend and um, how you're clearly not comfortable with the level of that. If you look at the group, uh, where do you see the areas of strong performance and where do you see the areas of weaker performance? So what are the priorities for you in terms of trying to address some of the areas that are underperforming? That's the first question. And then secondly, so looking at your career, you've obviously run life insurance businesses, but I think you, you probably agree that you're sort of, most of your career has been as a sort of, you know, PNC technician. Um, how do you see life insurance? And what do you see as sort of key success factors in life and savings? And how do you, how do you think you'll bring change to the way in which the group approaches those um, parts of the business? Second question. And then Tom, um, in your remarks, you mentioned um, some of the investments the group has made haven't paid off. Was that a comment that was focused on the digital investment or were there other investments that you think haven't really performed as anticipated? Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, John. Let me, I'll start with your second question and then go to your first. Um, I, and listen, fair comment. I, I've been with the organization for, for 26 years and, and probably spent about 20 years of that in, you know, in, in, in general insurance. I, I, I would note that you know, obviously the last two years I, I've, I've been running Europe. Um, which contributes about 800 million in, in operating profit from our life insurance businesses. Um, so I have learned a fair bit about life. I don't profess to be a global expert, but when I look at life insurance, I probably start with two, two things that are critically important. We have to have absolutely the right asset management skills. Secondly, it's about the product design, and the product design for really two reasons. One's around the capital intensity for our shareholders, and the other one is about the, the customer attributes. You know, when we designed the new product in, in Italy, we very much looked you know, at the macroeconomic environments in Italy, some of the spreads, and what customers were wanting. And they still wanted some security, but they also wanted upside, and that's why we had you know, a hybrid product which had a par guarantee, and it also had you know, uh, you know, unit link to get up, upside growth with, a, with an insurance protection wrapper. I think beyond those two attributes, it's a bit of a misnomer. Then when you get into you know, the, the life business, it's actually quite similar. You've got to be exceptional at distribution management. You've got to have people that understand your product. You have to have easy systems to do business with so that they can interact and, and, you know, with their customers and our, and our distribution channels. And the other one's about efficiency. You know, and I think I'm pretty proud at, you know, when I look at uh, certainly our Polish and, and, and you know, Italian businesses where we have you know, cost income ratios you know, in the mid 30s. I mean, pretty exceptional and competitive, and, and I think hence why we've seen the results that we have. When I step back and look at the group, you know, one of the things you know, that I've been hired to do is take the growth and actually put it onto a, a, a new plane. So when I look at you know, six of our eight major markets, you're starting with our, our biggest market that anyone's in the UK, 
had a pretty good year, you know, against sort of macroeconomic uncertainty and the strength of our brand still does pull in, you know, as a quality franchise. You look at our European businesses and they've, they've done excep exceptionally well and are, and are poised to actually probably accelerate some of them from that standpoint. You know, obviously Canada's had a tough year. That was a market phenomenon. Um, I wasn't happy with the pace of the turnaround. We brought in one of our strongest leaders in, in Colum Homes. Um, you know, we, we finished last year at a, at a run rate in H2 of 105. You know, to be at now at 102 and accelerating it and actually having got our biggest rate increase ever at close to 17% in, in RBC. You know, whilst that's one I'm concerned about, you know, it's a concern that's, you know, as Tom said, we're reiterating the guidance that gives us, you know, I'm not going to be reiterating guidance on my first day if I, don't, if I don't believe in it. We feel pretty good about the prospects. And I think the other one that, that stands out, you know, obviously is of even investors, but, you know, you're in the, you're in the team have actually done the right things, right? We've grown our revenue by 4%, and we've, and being part of Aviva, it allowed them to continue to invest, you know, against a backdrop where many of, you know, their competitors were sort of cutting investments because we actually believe in the strategy that we're putting forth for Aviva investors. So, you know, and outside of that, it's, it's, it's going after the efficiency. And, and for me, that's, that is the low hanging fruit. And, you know, whilst I'm not going to set targets today, you know, expect in, you know, when, we come, when we come back in May that we'll have something to say. And, and John, to pick up your other question, I, I think we've planted a lot of seeds. Um, and you, you pick out digital, you could talk about that, but there's others that I could point to as well. So you know, I, I look at the Canada acquisition that we've done, which we still think is going to be a great acquisition for us, but it just turns out our timing happened to be just at, at a time when sort of the market the was Ontario turning market down. Went. So mm -hmm. we've got more work to do. So. The point isn't so much that um, you know, these aren't investments that we should be making. It's more a question about driving execution and driving commercial outcomes from them. And so we still think we're going to get payoffs. They just aren't developing as quickly as we thought we, we, we might get all around the group. I put on the other hand, I'd highlight the investments we've made in Singapore around building the, the distribution network there as ones that have actually paid off quicker than I would have expected and, and, and really are, are showing good, tremendous results for us. So, one of the things that excites me about having Morris on board is that he's really a hands-on leader. He gets into things, he drives, he's relentless in following up, and I think that's what we need to make sure that we really get the payoffs from some of the investments we've been making. Johnny Vo, Goldman Sachs. Yeah, hi, it's uh, Johnny Vo from Goldman Sachs. Just um, three questions, if I may. Just, Morris. Um, in terms of your appointment uh, by the board, I guess, you know, the basis of your appointment, is the basis of your appointment based on any restrictions um, in terms of, you know, it's steady as she goes, or is your <coughs> mandate open-ended in terms of, you know, the direction you want to take the, the business? That's the first question. Second question is just in regards to the balance sheet of the group. Clearly, there has been significant de-risking of the balance sheet. I see a high proportion of government bonds on there. What has the impact been on the earnings of the group as a result of this? And third, related to that question, uh, just relates to, does this go in anti-phase to growth in bulk annuities, which increasingly is taking on more risk on balance sheet? Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks, Johnny. I'll, I'll, I'll take question one. I think Tom will take two. We, sure. might, we might hand off, hand off part of it. Um, so the, the simple answer is there are no restrictions. Um, I've been hired by the board effectively to make, make Aviva run better. Um, I think there is, um, as I said earlier, an awful lot of things that, that I can go after, go after in the short run. And, and I plan to work with my, my, with my colleagues to do that. Um, we'll set some pretty aggressive car targets. Um, I like setting uh, clear accountabilities and, and working with people to ensure we deliver those accountabilities. Um, you know, and that, that's across a range of things. So that, that's obviously efficiency, and, and, and I talked about that. Um, but it's also in, in how we work, and, and whether that's you know whether that's pricing, whether that's you know making sure that we get the right sort of investment management performance, whether that's service attributes for our customers. That's what I plan to do. You know, I think today to talk about the you know what's in the perimeter, what's the shape or group. And what's the strategic direction? Listen, this is day four, and I, and I would hope everyone in the room would, would afford me um, some comfort to meet with our largest uh, shareholders to spend time with my colleagues. But as I alluded to in, in my opening comments, I do plan to come out and speak, you know, with a little bit broader themes beyond the self-help story towards the end of the year. 
Well, in, in terms of your question around the balance sheet and the opportunity cost around earnings, I actually think that's a really hard question to sort of pin down because you're talking about lots of different capital uh, management actions. I work pretty closely with, um, with Mark Muir, my chief capital officer, with Jason Windsor in the UK and my other CFOs. And we try to focus more on an EVA analysis. It's not something we publish externally, but we, we look at our decisions in terms of whether we're adding value to the organization from an EVA perspective. In some of those cases, you know, by diversifying more and, and sort of getting better on the efficient frontier, we're actually adding earnings and adding value to the, the organization. In other cases, you may see short-term hedging costs, et cetera. And again, we manage the, the business more on a Solvency II basis than on an IFRS basis. So a lot of times there's not sort of a direct translation into, into short-term earnings. So I, I don't think of it that way in terms of there being a big uh, near-term drag. <laughs> When it comes to bulk annuities, I mean, that, that's a good example of a place where we are taking more risk and we have grown that business. We're happy with, with the growth that we got there. And I don't know if you want to talk, talk any more about that or? I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a fine business, but I think what Andy and Jason have done is shown incredible discipline and, uh, you know, control around margin. And, and I think, you know, we'll, when you're Viva, you're going to get me invite, invited to every dance. I mean, our brand resonates with, with UK corporates, um, but we've shown discipline to, you know, play in that market when we think the financial terms are, are attractive to us. Uh, Blair Stewart, Bank of America. Thanks. Thanks for introducing me, Chris. It means I don't have to bother. Um, three questions. Uh, what's happening with the FPI disposal? Quickly. Um, secondly, um, on debt leverage, uh, you've talked about a minimum of 1.5 billion. Now you've got that excess liquidity already and out to 2022, I'm guessing you'll build more. So how should we think about that? Is, is that, is that, uh, is that a very conservative estimate? How far would you want to take deleveraging? Do you want to be averagely levered or, or below average? Um, and thirdly, um, Morris, you talked about Aviva being a complex group. Um, what did you mean by that? And how, how would you address that? Is, is that? Does that come down to the perimeter of the group or is it, is it something more, you know, more detailed? Thanks. Okay, um, Tom, you can take probably one. I might make a couple, one point on number two, but and I'll okay. take take three. Okay, so on on Friends Private uh, International, that sale was agreed over 18 months ago. We are still committed to getting that deal done, as is RL 360. Uh, the we've got one of the regulatory approvals, but we're still waiting on the Hong Kong approval. That's proving uh, to be somewhat difficult and is taking some time. The regulators being very deliberate in that process. Uh, but we continue working with the, the buyer to try to get that done, and we're committed to, to getting it done. But obviously, there's some risk just given how much time has already elapsed. What plan is if we don't get it? I'm sorry? What's, what's plan B? Well, well, plan B is we keep working at maybe making changes to the transaction structure, et cetera, addressing regulatory concerns. And if, if that doesn't happen, we'll have to consider a number of different options. You want to say yeah, something about yeah, I was gonna say on, on the debt leverage is obviously we're, we're not planning on doing tender offers. So I think if you look at our, at our maturity schedule, I think it's, it's 200 million coming due uh, this year, followed by 500 million uh, in 20, um, and then 900 million the following year before we get into a, a, a peak uh, mm -hmm. maturity. So if you want to comment on the 1.5 and how we do yeah, that. Look, I, I think, um, you know, could we, could we do more than 1.5 billion? You know, as I said in my remarks, uh, possibly. Um, we're pretty comfortable ourselves in terms of the debt leverage, in terms of where we are right now. Um, and, and in terms of the way we're dealing the debt capital markets, um, you know, we're double A rated. Uh, we issued long-term debt in the fall um, in euros, sub 2%. So our borrowing costs are, are cheap. And if I could refinance that whole stack tomorrow, I'd love to do it. Um, but it's really a question uh, in terms of, of the equity markets and perceptions around our cost of capital. And so I think really that's the benchmark. So we're going to bring it down closer to peers. We're going to continue to look at what peers are doing. And when it stops becoming an issue, that's when I'll stop, uh, I'll stop dealing with it. Complexity, Blair, let me give you some examples. And they also form um, opportunities. We're incredibly complex internally. Um, and you see that uh, certainly that's, that's proliferated most here in the UK, uh, where we have a group office and we have a UK business, uh, you know, head office, and, and we also have shared services. And uh, I would think that, you know, from my standpoint, that that hasn't been built to, to effectively optimize and, and be efficient. So there's internal challenges. The same could be uh, said in, in some of our larger overseas businesses. 
But you know, more importantly, we also have challenges um, externally for our customers. You know, our customers can, can choose from you know, 50 different uh, colors of a home insurance product. Um, we have different pricing models that uh, you know, go across uh, you know, diff different channels. Um, and that creates confusion with our customers. Um, it also can be the root of you know, uh, you know, customer complaints. And that, that is something that I think is within our gift to fix. Um, but I also, more importantly, there's a cultural benefit of, of reducing complexity, and that's one of accountability. Um, and I like to work with, with leaders that have clear accountability. Um, that allows me to measure their success and allows us all to collectively course correct. So um, complexity is, is not just my view. Our employees tell us that we're incredibly <laughs> complex and bureaucratic. Um, it's one of the big levers we can pull to really sort of free up this place to move forward. Dominic, please. Thanks, Dominic Marnie, XM VMP Paribas. Um, two sort of specific questions and then sort of one slightly more broad question. Um, one is, I think you mentioned in terms of internal um, cash remittances, uh, the potential for special dividends beyond the UK. Um, is there anything in particular driving that? Um, and then secondly, in terms of the group solvency movement, a, a chunk of that was the recognition at group level of the French DVA. Um, any chance you could give us a, an update on the ratios and the major solo entities? Thank you. Uh, and then sort of a broader question, and Maurice, uh, I realize you've only had four days, but um, reflecting back on your 26 years, what would you say is distinctive and different about Aviva? Okay, I'll let, uh, let Tom start and I can think about my 26 years while he's, while he's answering that, those first two questions. Sure, so uh, special remittances really come from two sources. You know, one, we've had some big capital actions and as I said, there's typically a lag, so we've had some of that in France, for example. The other, I mentioned that we have a capital to cash program going on, which is a, a program that we've been running to try to make sure that all of our subsidiaries are optimized. And effectively, what we've, what we've seen is that through the process of moving to Solvency II, we've ended up building buffers on top of buffers through sort of natural conservatism of local chief risk officers and local boards and just local pragmatism. So we've gone back, we've looked at that closely, we've worked with local subsidiary boards, we set a, a new policy, for example, in the UK this year, and we're trying to drive the businesses closer to where they should be, not only just on a one-time basis, but on a repetitive basis. So that means there's a stock of, of capital that comes it becomes cash and comes up, but we also ought to get better flows on, our, on a recurring basis out of the subsidiaries. So that is one of the things that will drive some of those special remittances in addition to some of the big capital actions that we've had, not just in the UK, but also France and, and elsewhere. Um, we don't, r really don't publish uh, where we are in terms of our subsidiaries, in terms of exactly where those ratios are. But again, as you would expect with our excess capital position, I can tell you that they are all in a, what we would call our green zone, um, with the exception of Italy, which is sort of amber, just given all the volatility we've had in that marketplace. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question, Dominic. Um, I'll, I'll still align from, uh, from Tom's opening soundbite. Um, it's okay to be dull. Um, and, my, and my parallel on that, you know what, it's, it's okay to say I work for an insurance company and I'm going to make it the best damn insurance company uh, there is. And, and I think too many times, you know, when, when we or when I failed, I've forgotten that you know I work at an insurance company, and if I can get sort of you know the basics right around the technical fundamentals and the customer service, you know I truly believe that I can put this organization on a different plane for growth. And the second thing is I have to realize that that that, that customers are going to want to deal in at their time and their manner uh, with this organization. Um, and the reality is when 90 odd percent of our business comes from different channels, why would I not invest in those channels? You know, why would I not sort of realize the power of what we can deliver around distribution management um, to actually create inertia? Um, th there are so many partners, you know, and IFAs and brokers around the world that have been waiting and waiting patiently for a viewer just to say, hey, we love you too. Right? And I think doing that and having the right leadership, taking out the noise and the bureaucracy, um, this place, it, it goes to a different spot. Now, you know, you're going to have to judge, judge me in the, you know, in the months to come, but I would sort of say where I've instituted that sort of fundamentals and being technical, which also includes, you know what, sometimes in claims we don't pay them because they're fraudulent, and that's okay too. Right? That's a, we have that duty to all of our policyholders. But, 
Um, judge me on the track record. I've had lots of learnings in my 20 odd years. Me the media called me a veteran. I actually felt old for the first time. <laughs> uh, can we uh, do uh, Greg uh, and then Ashik and Oliver, please? Morning, everyone. Greg Patterson, KBW. Three questions. One is um, just can you talk about PS 1319, what uh, pro forma adjustments you did in the solvency to? Second point is, um, I note, I mean, the DVA FRPS adjustment was 0.7 billion, and you had guided much lower than that. And there's a point I want to make here. There's also a half a billion of hedging and uh, modeling costs. I mean, th these are black boxes and difficult to understand. I wonder if you could just talk about the potential for further of these in 2019. Mm -hmm. And then finally, for Morris, um, Italy, France, and Poland, what synergy do you see that those life businesses have with a UK life business. Okay, uh, thanks Greg. I actually am an accountant, but I will defer on the first two questions to Tom, if you don't mind, um, and happy to come back on the, the synergies in the continent. Well, I'm gonna to try to get other people in the room involved here, so I'm gonna ask Jason to talk a little bit, but um, essentially uh, the, the impacts of the equity release uh, consultation have turned out to be less than we thought they were gonna be, but there may still be some impact, and so we've decided to pro forma that. Yeah, sure, on um, 3118 or whatever it became known as, there was no impact on our balance sheet when we ran the PRA's effective value test, so that, that came through as, as zero. The, um, the consultation came out with another consultation into SCR. Uh, that hasn't been published yet, but we think there will be some impact, and we've estimated that at 0.2 billion, and we've pro forma that through the balance sheet. As it relates to your second question, Greg, about risk, uh, reduction within the balance sheet. We, we did a lot this year to optimize some second order risks, equity volatility, for example, some interest rate risk, and you can see that, how the SCR is reduced on a group basis. But we feel, I think as Tom was saying earlier, pretty, pretty well in balance around the risk and re reward profile as to where we are across the, across the investment risks. And, and look, more generally around uh, capital actions, uh, agree it's a black box. It's kind of hard to explain all that um, as we're working on it. We've had very strong other capital actions three years running. But if you go back and you look at some of the things that were driving mm -hmm. that, we had the Part 7 transaction in the UK a year ago. We had DVA and FRPS in France this year. I'm not talking about another big one of those things. I don't have another big internal merger project. So. There, there may be some small amounts. You know, there's always a bit of uh, tinkering with the modeling. Some of that will go the other way as well, as regulators say they want to see us strengthen things as they get to understand solvency too better. So, uh, you know, I, I think the prudent thing to do is, is to expect the capital actions to be lower going forward. I think we've gotten through most of the pipeline of the big capital actions. Uh, and, and Greg, um, you know, thanks for your question. I'm, I'm going to spin it a bit on its head. Um, I actually start with our with our, our biggest business, our, our flagship business in, in UK life. You know, it's a tremendous business. We have 16 million customers. We're, we're top three in, in, in all major product segments. Um, and we absolutely look for the depth of skills and talent in that business, whether it be around modeling, whether it be around sort of capital, whether it be around you know, asset management, we look to bring those to Europe. Now, within the continent, we've got some, some terrific businesses as well. Um, you know, certainly, you know, our, our French business is, is, is very strong. Um, it's particularly good on the distribution side. Um, you know, we've got a direct business. We have uh, the fourth largest agency networks. We have the leading um, uh, IFA channel in a pan actual. Um, and we've also got, uh, you know, UFF, or, you know, wealth manager. So they're particularly good at, at, at distribution. Our Italian business, you know, forced with a challenge a, f a few years ago um, when we had high guarantees, had to be innovative around product design. And I think if you look at us going from number 12 in the market to number five in the market, um, you know, in the better part of three years, that's something right now that we're looking at, at, at Poland. But we do start with our flagship business. Um, we do think there are synergies, particularly in the, the accumulation and saving space. I mean, obviously, the deaccumulation is, is, is different on the continent. It's more about sort of drawdowns and, you know, tax planning, estate planning. Uh, we, we don't have the, the sort of annuity market like we have in the UK. Um, but when Andy and I talk about it, we say there's huge opportunities. Uh, people always think that it's easier to share the, the general insurance attributes. That's nonsense. There's lots we can share in life. Ashik. Hi, Maurice. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, just a few questions. So first of all, Maurice, going back to your 
Far too complex comment again. Uh, sorry, coming it's back okay. to the same thing. Uh, is it fair to say that uh, the geographical presence is not uh, far too complex according to you, or will that be a part of your far too complex comment as well? And if that's the case, if you want to trim down your geographical presence, I mean, will solvency to diversification benefits uh, be a bit unhelpful in that situation? Because I remember around three, four years back, there was a slide back which showed that the, the diversification benefit from uh, the international businesses are quite good just because it's a different product, different geography. So any thoughts on that would be great. And second to Tom, uh, uh, any thoughts on cash basically because uh, uh, how does it support your deleveraging plan and uh, maintain a, a progressive dividend policy? Will you be trying to use a bit of central liquidity or you are comfortable that this will more or less still stay and uh, you'll still be able to meet these two dividends and, and the deleveraging plan? Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks, Ashik. I hope I don't disappoint on my answer on your first question. Um, it is day four, um, and I'm very much being hired by the board to make Aviva better. Um, and the first task at hand is, 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 is focusing on the stuff that, that I can see in front of me that we're going to change. And, and I'm going to come out to you in, in May and, and give you color, you know, real color that you can hold myself and the team to account. You know, Longer, longer term, you know, which you know, I know in this day and age, I can't say that's three or five years, so I'm signaling my intent to come out towards the end of this year. Um, and we'll look at the shape of the group. We'll look at the, at the perimeter. We'll look at the, at the component tree. We'll probably be, be guided by strong commercial sense. So it'll be, you know, what, what can we expect in terms of return on capital? Can we expect that this market will continue to thrive? What does Aviva bring that is unique and hence, you should be expecting me to you know, outperform, outperform the market. Those will be all the sorts of attributes today. I mean, sorry, when I speak to in, in November. Um, but today, I, I, I don't want to be drawn into speculation. So I'll, I'll say stay tuned. And on the cash story, the cash story is really good right now. So you know, we, we've got lots of parameters around how we try to manage cash from a risk perspective. So we keep central liquidity in that one to two billion pound range. We always keep a minimum of at least a billion. We also have a liquidity coverage ratio test that where we look out over two years on a stress scenario basis to make sure that we've got enough cash to pay our bills as, as they come due, um, including dividends. And uh, you know, if, under normal circumstances, um, uh, we ought to be able to maintain that, grow the dividend, and do all the debt deleveraging that we're talking about. So the, the cash situation is quite good right now. Uh, just two final questions. Uh, Oliver first, and then we'll go to Gordon, please. We might do three. Yeah. Oliver Steele, Deutsche Bank. Three questions. Um, first is on the IFRS. Um, guidance that you're giving us, the, the, the headwinds that you're talking about. Um, I haven't worked through all of the exceptionals yet, but it looks as if you've got sort of 10 to 15 percent of the result coming from net positive exceptionals. Um, it, in terms of the sort of less than 7 percent guidance or the headwinds that you're talking about, is that more a function of the underlying core business, core operations, or is it the exceptionals that you're talking about? Perhaps you can just give a little bit more uh, granularity around that. Secondly, taking that whole IFRS approach to the dividend, um, if 10 or 15 percent of your IFRS profits are actually exceptional, then your dividend payout ratio is in the upper 50s already effectively. So I'm um, just for sort of, th and, and that's not even going into any impacts from IFRS 17. So what happens, or how should we be thinking about underlying growth when it comes to the dividend? Uh, and then finally, on the Solvency 2 number, You've kept the upper end of your target range unchanged, even though you've put a sort of quite a lot of black box numbers into the new solvency ratio. Um, if 10 points of that are being deducted over the next four years from debt, so from, from debt reduction, it still looks to me as if you've got excess solvency, and yet you say you want flexibility. That sounds as if you want flexibility to spend money rather than to save money. So I'm just wondering how you comment on that. Okay, great, great. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll take the, the first question on how do I sort of, uh, you know, look forward in, in terms of our business. Um, I'll properly hand it to, to Tom on the, the flow through around dividend, and I think the last point was on sort of solvency, solvency too. Um, let, let me start by saying, because I can see my, my, my team here in, in the, the front row, I've not changed any of their targets. 
the targets have been established. The targets in which that you know they'll be remunerated on remain as is. Um, my long-term incentive plans with Aviva are predicated on, on growing EPS of this firm. What we said today is based on some things out there that we can't control. I mean, I did see that the OECD also sort of downgraded uh, you know, global growth today. Um, but we have Brexit and uncertainty and, and you know, the potential macroeconomic impacts of that. Um, we, we certainly, as, as you'll be well versed in, have a, you know, a rather jittery investment market those may have implications. But also what I'm saying very clearly is I think that with the self-help story from efficiency to running this place like an insurance company, I will put Aviva on a different plane for growth. So our comments today about guidance should be very much viewed as in the short run, the numbers may, may be tempered because of things that we can't control. So I wouldn't overly read into that. Um, Tom, do you want to flow through yeah, into, let me, into dividends let me, and solvency too? Uh, pick up from there. I, I, I think you're overestimating a little bit sort of the net impact of, of some of the additional items, but let me just talk more generally. As we look at dividend affordability, we look at solvency two, underlying cash flows, um, and we look at the regular remittances coming out of the business. So the special remittances that come on top are extra. That's all gravy. So the dividend is definitely affordable sort of by the underlying business. Um, and we've thought about payout ratios in the past based on that. Um, in terms of the, the impact of, uh, of sort of those net exceptionals, I think of it as we've given guidance that the other income coming out of the UK life business should typically be 150 to, uh, to 200 million. This year it's 350 million, so it's about 150 million more than it might otherwise be. And we've said that actually it may remain elevated next year and possibly longer than that, depending upon what happens. So. Um, so that's, that's not as big as it's sort of that 15% contribution that you're talking about. And in any event, when we have, um, we have exceptional items running through or special cash remittances, we're not considering them in terms of looking at dividend affordability. Um, finally, you're exactly right that uh, in terms of where we are on the Solvency II cover ratio, it's going to take us a number of years to, um, uh, to pay down the debt and make progress on bringing that number back down to the to the more efficient capital range where we'd like to be. Um, and then it's going to be part of our long-term planning in terms of thinking about how we deploy capital. I'd like to be putting that capital to work um, so that we're writing new business. Um, I'd love to see more new business strain as the company grows faster. So um, You and me both. Yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, you know, give us some time on that. And, uh, and absolutely, that's one of the things that we need to optimize further. Gordon, please. So definitely from you, from Gordon. <laughs> Thanks, Gordon Aitken from RBC. Um, a couple of questions, please. And first on mortality, you talked about uh, mortality releases and how these are being used to invest in digital. Now, I reckon in 12 months' time, we're going to be sitting here um, hearing you saying that you have released over a billion of mortality reserves. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, you've, all your projects have end dates, you said. So will the spend on digital also exceed a billion? And the second question is... No. <laughs> That's an easy one. No. Yeah, no. That's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> second question is, I mean, in my time in an insurance company, I was always amazed how old the systems are, uh, and that probably runs for every company in the UK sector. Um, so the question is, in your UK business, how many mainframes are you running, and how many were built in the 70s? Um, and this is just to get an idea of, of where you are in this journey of transformation. Uh, well, I'll let uh, Tom take the first question and a half, I, I, I think, Gordon. And uh, we've never had our, our, our CIO come up and answer a question before. So Nick's getting ready to come up and talk about the number of systems that we have. Is it from the 70s specifically? Is that the decade you want? We can cover lots of decades with that. <laughs> with that. But we'll start with the 70s. Yeah, look, like just just to cover it off, um, it, it's it's I can't plan on what the longevity releases may or may not be next year. We actually have to look at the evidence and do the actuarial work. But clearly, the way this has been developing over time, it, it looks like we are likely to have uh, more material longevity benefits again next year. So you're right, and that may be a big boost to to, to income. We also had some offsetting provisions this year, which kind of tempered the impact of, of what was coming through. We also had some elevated spending. And as Moore said, he's laser focused on that spending. So if we did get a billion, that's going to be a, a 
big positive boost to income. Nick. So yeah, we have uh, quite a few mainframe systems and quite a large set of applications that support our businesses, bulk of those for the UK. But we have a formal program which is funded to drive a migration off the mainframe systems onto cloud. The, the, uh, the exam question I'll, I will have to Nick, uh, what would it take an in investment to significantly reduce our run rate in IT? You know, and that's the kind of investment that absolutely I would make because it is probably our single, next to staff costs would be our single biggest line item would be IT costs globally. Can we squeeze one in from Andrew? Yeah, we'll fin finish with Andrew Crean, please. Thank you. Uh, it's Andrew Crean, as well, Thomas. A couple of questions. Firstly, um, could you give us some uh, clearer guidance on the special uh, cash remittances coming in 19 from the act, capital actions in 18. And secondly, I think about six months ago, you talked about the strategic investments coming down to about naught by 2020. I think you're now talking them, of them rising from minus 142 upwards. Yeah. Um, could you tell us what's happened in the meantime and some initial thoughts on the broad range of Asian <laughs> JVs, which are presumably contributing to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then, and then Morris can add. So look, on special remittances, targets generally, you know, that's something that we, we, we need to come back and talk to you about. So as Morris uh, talked about earlier, there's going to be some updates later in the year. We're not providing sort of a new set of, of uh, financial targets today other than the debt deleveraging that, that we've talked about. Um, but, but absolutely understand the interest in trying to quantify exactly how much that could be this year, the next year, over a longer term sort of cumulative basis. Um, in terms of strategic investments, um, yeah, you're exactly right. I was not anticipating effectively the, the overspend that you saw this year in terms of digital. And that the, uh, the Asian businesses have been performing nicely, so most of that um, increase in expense is caused, as I said in my re remarks, from uh, continued spending for digital innovation, which we thought was going to be covered by higher volumes at better profitability. Um, coming out of the, the UK business, some of on, the, on the GI side, some on the life side, but in a softer market, we just didn't get those volumes, didn't get that profitability, so we ended up with, uh, with an overrun. The only comment I'll add, um, and, and I know there's been an element of, of impatience with, with, with our Asian strategy, I, I think you know, if you look at the Singaporean business, which some would have you know, written was, was dead after we lost DBS, I mean, what the team's done, and, and Tom's already alluded to this, I think that's a pretty exceptional thing, and we should expect that business to, to keep growing. I mean, we launched a, a new proposition in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, the first digital initiative you know, of its kind. Um, that's starting to see some, some early, early, uh, early gains. I mean, China had, had a good year. Um, I, along with Chris, would, would arguably be disappointed with Indonesia, so we're certainly going to make a uh, you know, focus, and, and Chris has hired a you know, a great new executive and, and Randy Laguerre who's got experience in, in Indonesia. Um, and listen, we are still cautiously optimistic, albeit I've got nothing to say today on, on India. But um, suffice to say, we hope to be um, advising on that shortly. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to Morris to close. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate uh, the, the comments and questions today. Um, I should also thank Tom because he kind of held the, the entire show and uh, he's probably given me a bit of a free pass today. So, so thanks, Tom. <laughs> not, only, not only for doing that, but also just on in uh, 96 hours, the guidance and counsel you've given oh, me happy in, to do it. in, happy in, to do in it. Getting, getting ready for this. Um, they asked me to be an awful lot more downbeat, not my normal self, so I hope that came across. Um, um, but I will very much look forward to, to May. Um, I'm not one to, 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 to dangle things, and I'm not one to speak in riddles, so you will get clarity as I know it on where we're going to take this great company. So thanks very much. <laughs>